But uh, for me, the interesting point is like, there is one step that I don't understand. And uh, well, the use of, like usefulness of that depends on how often it is like this process is repeated. You know, if you can uh, write a smart contract in uh, Plutus and compile it once and then use it for 100 years, there's not much use in automating this. But if it's, this is a process that be repeated, you know, then it's kind of useful. Right. For me, it's also interesting the way, uh, how, why and how this works, because, you know, there's like several steps and, uh, okay, I understand what happens when you run Nix shell, but then you kind of, you uh, do Cabal update. And what this does, I have completely no idea, like uh, how this uh, works with the Nix environment and uh, why is this needed and how to represent it, because Ideally, if I use Nix, I could just Nix build and have executable uh, from the code, right? But then mm -hmm. this step is like, it has to be represented somehow in the code. And how to do this may be useful, maybe not, I'm, I don't know. I, it's kind of, that's what I'm experimenting about right now. You know things that only a few people do. And dude, thank you. Thank you. It's an awesome environment and nice uh, task to work on. And it's like, I enjoy it. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Steve. Hey, Nelson. Hey, James. Um, what's up, dude? Just, just living the life, you know? Um, I was just telling the guys that I was just dreaming big with Jingles, Abdel Cream, and Santiago, and yeah. I'm thinking ahead to maybe some ideas around certification, right? So building upon the the SIP sixty eight based contributor token and and record of mastery levels work that we have. Um, thinking when you about say certification. When you say certification, certification yeah. of what? It's funny you, you asked that because as soon as I said that word when we were meeting a few minutes ago, I was like, that, that, that just doesn't feel like the right word. It almost feels too formal or, or beyond what we're going for. But what I mean is a, a statement of expertise. A, a statement that this developer has achieved this level of understanding of mesh or the TX pipe tools, maybe, and maybe that's disaggregated, right, into each tool, Aura, Palace, Aiken, the other ones. Okay, so a well, way let me, let me this to have you. experience. Yeah, well, let me let me suggest that. If there's going to be a, a DAP certification mm -hmm. process, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, recognized by whatever the community, I mean, it, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a bad idea at all to have the smart contracts that are written in fulfillment of bounties, you know, and the GPTE to go through that certification process. And that just only enhances what we're doing already. Yeah. Yeah. What's ha what's the latest on the IOG LACE app certification process? Do, are there any resources that provide a little more depth that have come out recently? I haven't, I haven't investigated it lately, but a couple of months ago when I was looking at it, it was just all I found was an, uh, an explanation of the different tiers of certification. So and I, you know, and I don't know, I think that this is one reason why Charles was drawn to the MBO idea, because you have to have these bodies that give formal validation of, the, of these kinds of things. It can't just be input output doing it. You know, he needs yes. larger bodies. It's part of the reason he funded that thing in, in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got to be everybody agreed on that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm eager to see, I mean, 
it, it's really hard to know what the expectations are going to be. And every just visual I've seen of what is a DAP in the lace version of a DAP store, I'm, I'm very curious to find out, like, what are the requirements on the UI side, right? Do, do I, what, I mean, is it, is, I don't think it's going to be iOS only, but like, right, is it going to be iOS web-based or desktop apps? Is there, how does a headless app with maybe many different heads fit into that? For, well, if that's we, kind of... right, If you create GPTE, let alone the concern of many instances, but even just for one instance, and you have a version that's in English and a version that's in Spanish, yeah. are those... Do those need to be verified separately or how does that work? So, okay. And can you automate that? You know, I mean, can you automate auditing? Can you automate the certification stuff? You know, like I, you know, like you, they pay big money to these auditing companies. You know, what do they do except try it out? Right. 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 I mean, they'll, they'll look through the code, but, but, I, you know, I don't, I don't know how you could, what I'm curious about is, do you need like a, a code detective to look for back doors? Does that have to be done by a human or can you automate that, that kind of thing? Uh, you know, Steve, I think this process is rather creative because I just recently was reading about this with a tweak had a vacancy of a software uh, audit engineer. And that's, you know, you need some kind of good mathematics to go there. You know, you have to be able to work with their improvers and to represent um, finite state machines with uh, like logic statements. And that's a kind of, uh, I don't know how to do that. And I know, don't know anyone who knows, you know. Well, the ones that I've met, you know, like the MLABS guy, that was a really nice guy. He's very easy to talk to. And I, and I think whenever, you know, we, we feel like talking to him, he's, he's going to be pretty easy to talk to and, and kind of get some ideas about what what's really feasible and not feasible. And how do you do, how do you, how do you certify and audit headless steps? How do you do that? Because right? I mean, this is like, this is stuff we kind of want to release to the world. How do you do it with confidence? Well, you go to conferences uh, on cybersecurity, find the best solutions possible and satisfy. So we're using just like, you know, the latest solutions that like are yeah, not sure state of the, the art. Way. Sure yeah, that for that would sure. Be, maybe it would be fun. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, Lucas, that's a good question. Hey, Lucas. Hey, Juan. Hey, Jingles. Oh, Jingles came and went. Um, yeah, so, right, so, so air gapping at the highest level, recognizing that we can build a transaction on one device that's hooked up to the internet, because in order to build the transaction, you have to look at the network and, and what UTXOs are currently there to make sure that they're spendable then taking that built transact that drafted transaction transferring it by some method to a computer that's never touched the internet and has your signing key on it signing the transaction there and then transferring the signed transaction back to the hot computer that's hooked up to the network and submitting it so I'm not aware yet of any Cardano wallets that provide that directly other than the, the, uh, the CN tools um, from, the, from the Cardano Operators Guild. It's, it's basically a bash-based wallet and it's wonderful. If anybody hasn't used uh, CN tools yet, I'll grab the link for that. All right, but to me, that's, that's the best way to do it or it's simply just to, you know, use Cardano CLI, but like anything with a user interface is, is going to be tied to the network. 
interesting project to look at. It's really weird. Yeah. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah. It's something that's been nagging me for a long time. You know, people keep telling me I need to buy a ledger, etc. And I often tell them, okay, just if you just generate, uh, for example, in, in Bitcoin, you just use a blue, blue wallet to generate your seed phrase on an offline device, and you've created yourself a savings account. But you can't move it, right? And with Cardano, we have the same problem so far. I was taking a look at Eternal, where I'm pretty sure that Eternal allows you to build. So, for example, if you go to the TX Builder UI, you can select your inter, your, your input UTXOs and draft your outputs. And I think you can download that file. Uh, so maybe, except for the QR part that I was inventing there, uh, I think maybe Eternal will allow you to download a TX file unsigned and then sign it on an offline other computer. But just to create that wallet in the online computer, you would need to put in there the seed phrase. So it's not a solution anyway. And it's really puzzling to me if we're all talking about self-custody and I'm really not a fan of the hardwares and all that, the, the ledgers. Uh, why isn't there an open source solution for this? Because it's not that hard technically, conceptually at, at least, to, to have okay, a machine that knows uh, what's on the UTXOs and instantly it issues a TX in a QR form. And then the other machine has the key and signs it and issues a QR code of it, of it signed. It seems like a, a nice opportunity for even a proposal if, if anyone has the ability to build this. But then so, it wouldn't be maybe commercially viable because we won't be able to build something that's going to compete with Eternal and Lace and everything. So it's just this use case that I keep going back to. I hope you find this interesting. Sorry for the rant. No, it's good. I mean, have you, did you ever see Martin Mahir? Uh, he's a Dutch person. Not um, really, no. And, he, and he's got, he got a proposal funded to build a, his idea started off as a point of sale thing. You know, a device, you know, where you know you could go into a store and you could buy some crypto and then it would print out a qr code for you of your new wallet yeah. address and, mm -hmm. and whatever cryptos are on it and then he integrated i, I never really <clears throat> dove into it much but he started working with adriano from gay changer and and integrated with that and it was it was shockingly fast and easy the way what he demonstrated there and I, I, you know, it sounded like you had not seen what he was doing there. And it's, it's very similar to what you're talking about. And it kind of wanted me, made me want to ask James, you know, like if you were, if you were dealing, if a person was to deal with their wallet directly on the CLI, you know, just going under the chain and, and doing what you do in a transaction, can you, can you generate a QR code from the CLI? And that, or would you have to have an extra software? Well, I, I think a QR is just a, a rendering of, you can encode anything as a QR. So as long as you have a library to transform a string in a, into a QR, that's sort of feasible, I think. It could be a very dense QR, big enough, uh, quite big, but yeah. Could you drop me the, that name you mentioned on the, on the chat, please? Let me look him up. Nelson, do you want to go ahead, please? Hey, Nelson. Yeah. Oh, just uh, talking about this wallets thing, I uh, something that I don't fully understand is uh, uh, wallets that uh, we uh, we are like uh, how do I put uh, so we use different addresses each time when we use a wallet, like the addresses change every time, right? So. Uh, uh, I don't quite fully understand why that is, and uh, it, I think it is something to do with the public key. Uh, once you signed it, uh, some things are out there, so you you we avoid using of the same address uh, in wallet. So they generate uh, there's a master key, and they generate uh, multiple addresses, right? Uh, so if we have not signed a transaction from that uh, address, then uh, uh, is that address as secure uh, 
to use for additional uh, input like uh, we want to receive some things on that address multiple times <coughs> is that uh is that uh the, the, do we get the same security or like if we have one input one thing came into that address then we should use another address next time for something uh, to receive something like Am I clear or I'm just yeah, no, you're 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 perfectly clear. And I'm curious if anybody else has thoughts on this because personally, I have not yet seen a compelling argument for why we need multi-address derivation wallets. And so we saw with we saw with Kyle, Kyle kind of took us a few weeks ago through. And you can see it in eternal, right? It's it's got the the string that represents the network, and then it's got it's got a couple of indexes, but that last index there is just it, it's it's being used to specify which address from the possible set of addresses for these keys we're going to use. But it but those those are all related to the first of all the same private key and if the result was some level of privacy right this this ambiguation is that the word i'm looking for or just distinction between these different addresses in a way that people couldn't tell that they all belong to the same keys like that would be great yeah, exa exactly, Lucas. Like, but the truth is, even if I pick from one of my unused addresses in, for example, Deadless or Eternal, on a blockchain explorer, they're all unified or can be easily unified anyway. So what is the point? I, I still don't, I, I don't have a way of saying to somebody, what's the point of having all of those derivations? James, I think I read up on something that on Cardano and uh, Cardano official website, I think. Uh, like you cannot differentiate those addresses that are derived from the same master key unless it's uh, connected through the stake address. So if you're not staking that address, that wallet, then basically you have you have no way of knowing if the addresses are linked to a same master key or not. I, I think I read up. I remove okay so it's the staking credentials right so if i skip the staking part then i can have these different addresses derived from the same key and there's no connection between them but then the prices i can't stake yes so the cost of that privacy is well okay you, you can have those multiple addresses but you can't have the rewards Uh, I have one other thing. I have been looking into uh, ledgers devices and I don't understand why there is a, uh, when you try to receive, they want, uh, they want you to verify the address through the device. Uh, otherwise they say it's not the highest level of security. I don't understand the part what like. Uh, why do I need to verify the receiving address through the device? Do you have, uh, anyone has any idea? You're saying on a ledger, when you want to receive, you have to confirm in order to receive? Yeah, it's something I can grab the link from the website, uh, yeah. but they say that you can still receive uh, those funds uh, from Ledger Live app, uh, they will give you an address and you can receive in that address, you'll still get the fund. But uh, it, if you are not uh, verifying that the receiving address that is shown in the Ledger Live app is not, uh, if you don't verify that is the address using the device, then they're saying that you don't have the highest level of security. I mean, I don't know how much that the mm -hmm. difference is. Uh, I'll find that part in their website. And 
I'm curious about where in the transaction process that verification happens. Like, are you verifying before it's submitted on the other end? And if so, how does that work? That's the, that's the only way I could make sense of that. But yeah, let me know. Um, I have a treasure and I find it to be a really good tool. Um, I, I got it just to experiment with it. And after experimenting with it, I was like, okay, this, I can see that this is easier than some other options. Um, can I just ask um, another thing that's puzzling me a lot is uh, when you have your treasure, do you have visibility and, and are able to save your on-chain uh, seed phrase for your Cardano account? Or does it really only give you a seed for a treasure seed phrase? Good, good. Okay. So that, that's a perfect question. I'm going to answer it, but first indirectly. Okay. So think about the keys that you generate on Cardano CLI. And when you have your V key and your S key file, you don't have mnemonics for those. Right? Yeah. And that's basically what there was before there were mnemonics on Bitcoin. There were these key file pairs. BIP, whatever, 33 or 39. 39, 39 yeah. right? Okay. And we got these, we got these mnemonics. And that was that was a great advance because it meant that people could it was possible to on paper or even in your brain memorize the thing in that in a way that was easier than writing down just a string of characters okay so mnemonics gave us that abstraction that provided a different interface right the, some people like to use brain phrase right there there or paper whatever um a hardware wallet skips the mnemonic phrase. And what it essentially does is it holds key files for you. It doesn't matter what format they're in, right? It holds your private keys and then derives addresses and verification keys from those and only passes to the computer that it's connected to the address or or the pub key hash okay but it keeps the signing key on the the, the hardware wallet is essentially an air gapped machine right it you hook it up to a networked machine mm -hmm. but the signature never goes onto that networked device now the mnemonics for the hardware device itself are just two things to think about there. One, it's good to have a way to back up your hardware, right? A, a, a hardware wallet can be easily stolen or it can be easily lost. And if that happens, there needs to be a way to recover that. And what your hardware mnemonics do is they allow you a way to say, okay, if I lose this hardware, I can buy another one. And then I can, I can recover it by entering these words. In both cases, at the creation stage and the recovery stage, those words never go onto a computer. They only go onto the hardware device itself. So they're they're not, you know. Key loggers are not going to catch you, for example. Yeah, but my, my thing is, my question is, you you so basically when you have your treasure seed phrase, it's a treasure hardware seed phrase, and it's right. going to allow you to replicate another device, the same things and the same keys, uh, but you're hostage in a way to the fact that you if you lose your hardware, you're going to need another hardware. So in a way, you have access to moving money out of that account, but you don't really have custody of that blockchain key if you don't have the device. Okay. Sure. 
So you have yeah. a key. So it's literally like making a key for a house, putting something inside the box, and you have the key to the box, but you don't have what you don't like. You can't if if you lost the box or something. If you want to take the thing out of the box, you need to just send the, sign it out of it. You can't really. For example, if you broke your treasure key, your, your treasure hardware, with the seed prints that you have in your pocket, you wouldn't be able to access your Bitcoin. You would need to buy another hardware. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. For like the house key analogy, it's kind of like saying, I'm going to build a lock for my house. And the key has to be made of gold. Right. I can't just go to yeah. a locksmith and get, you know, a, a cheap key, but I need to get one made out of this. Like, sure, what you're saying is exactly right, except the custody part, right? So this is where definitions of custody are open to interpretation. And the mm -hmm. reason I would argue that you do have custody is that no one else does, right? Those your keys are still not anywhere else. So if there is any custodian of them, mm -hmm. okay, it's still you, it's you, right? Do you have to use that hardware? Yeah, you do. Would that be inconvenient to need to buy the hardware again if you lose it? Yes, of course it would. That's 150 bucks that I'd be pissed off to have to spend again. But weigh that against the alternatives and we all get to decide for ourselves if we'd be more pissed off about some other scenario. Yeah, yeah. So it's still it's still useful to to generate signatures without compromising your your keys. And I'm also curious if the namespace of a bit thirty nine is shorter than the pure binary, let's say, key that's generated. Do you know that? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so it may even give you keys that are a bit more technically profound and and secure but i'm still a bit puzzled that i need that hardware and that it's closed source and everything but it's just me being you know i i would think i think i for now i'm just using paper wallets and like i've been explaining it, it pains me a bit to think that my seed phrases are are hot in my browser extension plus the paper wallets um but i think i would more more quickly buy one of those encrypted pen drives that mm -hmm. Charles Hoskinson presented in the YouTube, probably you've seen it or something, where mm -hmm. you can buy sort of a military grade pen drive that encrypts and has a key for you to access its content. And you can only do, and you could, you know, manage that in a, in a, an air gapped computer or something. I think I would go to the bother of trying to set that up rather than buying a ledger. But yeah. it's just. Yeah, there's a good argument for that. But... Yeah. But, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. From a cost perspective, buying another computer to never connect it <laughs> to the internet yeah. costs more than a treasure. Yeah, you're right. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Um, what I had on my agenda today was to look at the actual project descriptions together. Um, but we can also do anything. Uh, we could we could look more at the uh, contributor token pairs that we started looking at yesterday. Um, or there's some other uh, contract ideas for extending GPTE. Anybody feel strongly about going one way or another, or should we default to just looking at some project tasks together? I'm still on module 200. <laughs> so I'm oh, I got a merge request from Sarah. Oh, yeah, by, okay. the, by the way, I'm going to hop to that other session with Emir to work on that module. But thanks for the chat. Okay, guys. All the yeah, best. Man. See you soon. See you soon. Yeah, James, I put out a merge request. So if you can merge it, thanks. 
Let me start there. Let me do that live first. Oops, I need to enable screen sharing over here. Hey, how's everybody doing with faucet contracts since we got stuck last week? I, I haven't ran into problems since then, but I don't think I've covered every case. Okay, so I'm merging what Sarah shared. Um, and let's go. This is a workflow that is, of course, uh, ripe for automation, <laughs> um, but it it does the trick because I'm I'm willing to take the time to you know do this as this is just my grading process. But in the PPBL front end template, if I get full now, uh, here's the latest changes from Sura. Please, I just did this on the other machine yesterday. Um, so then, and actually, this was interesting. I was playing around with some new mesh stuff. Um, mesh now has, I just tested it, um, a function called resolve Plutus script address to which we can pass a Plutus script with a version and CBOR and we pass the network, so zero for testnet. And this successfully gave me the same address as this one right here that I had just grabbed from CLI. So now it's it's built in to Mesh now that if you've got the CBOR, Mesh will calculate the address for you. That's pretty cool, right? Mm. Um, I'm still going to go here for now to the front end template, add the address and the script, and then let's go here. That was TZEN, right? Have we just grabbed the X? So if you register that metadata now, sir, it should work. You should be good to go.
Okay, thanks. I haven't registered the metadata yet. I'll do that shortly. Cool. Um, and I, this is, I'm, I'm really excited about this part, right? Like you can see there's a bit of inefficiency here. Those couple of steps I just had to go through and there's certainly some automation we can do, sure. But what I, what I want, all of us to think about because I'm I'm eager about what breakthroughs we're going to discover together. Um, is how how will we scale something where we are registering multiple instances of a headless app? Right? How how does that metadata process feel? Is there a different way to think about it? Could we do that registration not with metadata, but with inline contract data, like we're like we are testing out with SIP 68, um, so that it can be a little bit more flexible? Um, so I'm really curious to hear what people discover as you're thinking through that. It's fascinating looking at this seabor and seeing where it's common and where it's not because at the end of the day creating parameterized contracts might be as simple as right alex all this stuff we're doing with plutus and nix might be unnecessary what if it was just concatenating strings in just the right way that'd be awesome if it's uh, sounds this easy you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so um, th th there's there's room for there's still more to learn here. Um, I'm curious where we end up. So on the on the projects front, we've got this URL right here. And um, I already put this in the Discord chat, but I'll put it in the Zoom chat as well. Let's do just a little bit of asynchronous work here. If you can, if you can open up this link on your device, find a find a project card that you disagree with, right? Is there any, are there any things listed here that shouldn't be listed? Or do you see something that's missing? Can we write a new project description together? Or if you click through into any of these, do you have questions? And some of them, they just don't have all the details yet because I'm still working day by day to, to flesh these out. Um, but I'm curious to hear what you guys think about the projects that are currently listed and wanted to take just a little time to, to share this space with each other. So I'm gonna mute for a few minutes. When you find something, uh, unmute and, and say so. Yeah, James, on that one, uh, like, uh, allow only when uh, multiple commit commitments are allowed, like, uh, that part, is there, 
a limitation set for the other ones, other things. You said allow, which one uh, is it? I can see for the implement live commitment status in the front end projects third. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Uh, oh, it was right, that was the one I had open. Yeah, yeah. Multiple commitments. When multiple commitments is true, where is that multiple commitment parameter? Yes, let's look at that. This is a good one. And this is, this is a fun puzzle. And uh, this is one of the ones I'm excited to play with. Um, uh, okay. Let's jump over to that. I just have to. Okay. So first of all, I will, I'll open up this project number three as the example, so we can both flesh out the description. Uh, so the idea here is that there's certain, there's certain projects that we just want to allow as many people as want to, to do it, right? Project number one is a great example of this. Just make a style for this card. The rewards aren't that high. Right? Five ADA and 100 gimbals. And this one, it feels like, oh, that should say true. Okay. I don't know why it doesn't. Okay. Right? We want to allow as many people, anybody who wants to, should be able to make their own version of a project card. Why? Because what this thing is really about is providing an entry point for people to contribute to this open source project to get their first project commitment under their belt so they can move on to bigger and better things. And so they can get familiar with how this front end works, right? It's, it, it feels good to find your way around. Fine. But not every project should be like that. Not every project should allow just as many people as possible to implement the thing. Some are going to be too expensive to do that, maybe, right? If, if, we're, if we're making the rewards high enough to do a difficult task, maybe as an organization or as a project, we can only afford to pay for that thing once. Um, and then others, it's just unnecessary redundancy to have right, to have many people working out on one thing. So this, the technical answer to your question is it happens right here, okay? We have a multiple commitments, true or false field in the metadata right here. So for now, the gatekeeping is uh, only in the front end. So if anyone tries using, using Cardano CLI, then they can commit to already committed. Aha, right. Well, so right now there's no gatekeeping at all. This this field is here, but it doesn't make a difference. So this one says false, but there's nothing yet stopping anybody from committing to this one after somebody else has. Is this not a project uh, start date and end date? Yes, somewhere. Good. So we don't know when a project will start, right? Uh, this project will start when somebody commits to it. Currently hard-coded into the front end is a JavaScript function that adds 30 days to the current time as expressed in, in epoch time. Uh, we add 30 days, 30 days worth of milliseconds to that number. And that becomes the expiration time <clears throat> as POSIX time in the bounty commitment that goes on chain. Now, will 30 days always be the right amount? I mean, for, for task number one, I expect this to take substantially less than 30 days. But what the deadline is really doing here is it just ensuring that anybody who signs up for this one and then doesn't do it, we have a way to reclaim the Lovelace and the Gimbals from the escrow contract. There might be cases where it's going to take longer, right? So we maybe we need the ability to have like an expected time allotment 
right? Which so it could default to 30 days, but some projects, it might be better to assume that they will take 90 days or, or something like that. So we could add that. Um, but yeah, that's that's really the only way for now that time is being handled. Uh, I have a question now. I think you might have dealt with the same question before, but uh, I just it's just coming to me now. So the validator param parameters, like right, uh, mm -hmm. is there any way for it to be an input instead of uh, like so the the validator parameters includes a policy ID, let's say. So is there any way that 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 variable is defined in the contract. It's the contract is uh, now live on the chain, and uh, when you interact with the contract, you have to give an input to a variable, and it's get it gets set to the contract. Uh, like my idea is like if we want the time duration to be. Uh, not only 30 days but as an input when we commit uh, then is there any way sort of handling that yeah um at the at the contract parameter level i would have to think more about the implications of adding that here let's let's come back to that in just a moment but when it comes to at commitment time, right? Is there a place in some datum or redeemer or something where we could include time? I think absolutely. Okay, so bounty details, which is used in the treasury redeemer and is the same as the bounty escrow datum in terms of the shape of that data. At the moment, all it has is an expiration time, but it doesn't have to be this way, right? We could we could add a field to the bounty details here, such that the the time commitment for a given project is explicitly stated here it's implicit here because the the expiration time the way we're doing it on the front end like i said we add 30 days worth of milliseconds um and you can look at an on-chain transaction you can look at the the time stamp of the commitment transaction and the resulting expiration time that was placed right here in the datum. And with those two things, you can just do some arithmetic to find out how much time was allotted to that thing, right? So, so it's, it's a value that you could derive by some other method, but maybe there's a good reason to explicitly name that here, right? Like, project or like expected project days or something like that, right? And that could be an integer. We could certainly do something like that. But but Nelson, am I am I understanding the question right? Do you have something else in mind? Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh like it's what I had in mind was uh so, no, I mean this is cool. Uh I kind of forgot that this part comes in the datum, uh, in the what JSON, right? JSON file, datum yeah. file, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I kind of forgot. I I thought this was written inside the contract, like thirty days is the maximum mm. amount you can stay in the escrow. Like, I uh, James, I, I'm sorry, James. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. What if someone uh, needs more time, if he or she puts in a request for more time, and they have progressed quite well in the pro on the project, but they need some more time. So how do we 
uh, give them more time. Good. Okay. And this is, these are, these are all questions that I think if this goes well, we're all going to have better answers to these questions six and 12 months from now, right? We get to, we're going to try to figure these things out as we go. Um, but the direct answer, Sarah, to your question, in the escrow validator, which only the issuer can interact with, there's three things the issuer can do. They can cancel the project commitment after a deadline. They can distribute when the thing is done, or they can update that project. What are the two things they can update? They can, oh, okay, I, hmm. Wait, hold on one second. I, this is not encoded here. I, I thought I had done this, but it's not done. And so we, we do need to add this to this contract, but here's the way I'm thinking about it. Um, output fulfills value. Let's look at this first and you can see the error message. The output UTXO value must be greater than or equal to what the datum specifies, okay? And so if I go down to output fulfills value, it says that the we have to look at the outputs to contract. Um, and and what are we looking for? We're, we're looking for this helper function output contains value where we say, OK, look at the look at the bounty tokens and make sure it's greater than or equal to what was in the datum, which means that you can't you can't update a bounty and decrease the tokens in it. Right. The issuer can only change that project by adding more tokens, never by removing tokens. And what I wanted to do, what I thought, what I thought was actually already done, is in addition to being able, be, being able to add but not remove tokens, the issuer, I believe, should also be able to add but not remove time, okay? And so the person who committed comes along and says, hey, uh, we know each other. I'm working on this, and I'm telling you it's going to take it's going to take longer, right? You can there's two ways to deal with that. One, the issuer can just say, oh, it's all good. I'm not going to cancel it. I heard from you. We're good. You know, just when you're done, I'll distribute it. Fine. But if there's not that level of trust for some reason, the issuer should be able to come in and say, okay, I hear you. Thanks for making that request. Uh, and yeah, just, just so you know that we still have this contract, I'm going to update that project and extend the deadline and there's nothing there's nothing here right now stopping an issuer from changing the expiration time however they want to they could change it to an earlier deadline which is actually something we don't want to allow but at the moment that's possible or they could of course add more time so so that's going to be, you know, from a technical perspective, thanks for that heads up. I, I didn't realize that was not included here and it needs to be added. So that deadline can only be extended, but not shortened. We could we could add a bounty for that one. Um, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. So how do the issuer go about it uh, extending the deadline to the redeemer.json file? Uh, how it how would does be, it <clears throat> so by the time by the time you get to here? The escrow validator, this information is just held in datum. So you would be updating the datum at the at the escrow UTXO. Mm 
Yeah, okay. For the next few months, we're going to be, you know, continuing to work in this space where we have the level of trust we've all established so far, right? Which is, I'm proud of it, but, you know, I know that we need to work together to further establish that. Um, and with the awareness that these systems still rely on a relatively high level of trust between people and aren't necessarily ready to scale and be used by millions of strangers who have not established trust. And I'm, I'm going to continue to be curious for the next few years, where's the balance there, right? To what extent do we want to build tools that work best in high trust situations? Uh, and to what extent is our goal to to scale to as many people as possible. You know, that's there's always gonna be a back and forth there. Yuli, good to see you here. Hey. Yeah, hi everyone. <laughs> you're, you're still booked for Switzerland next week, right? Yeah, I will come on Monday, I think. <laughs> oh, good. Looking forward to seeing you there. Okay, fine. Me too. So back to this problem. I, I'm, I'm actually really interested in this as a technical problem. The, you know, what can we do on the front end and or what can we do with Plutus? when we only want to allow one commitment at a time, for example. Um, and so that's, that's obviously, that's something that will be really fun to talk about. Uh, but from a requirements perspective, let's use this one as a case study to try to say enough that this, that this feels appropriately described, okay? Um, so I'm going to go back to this one here. And our shared work here is to figure out, okay, hey, what's, what is the standard or the minimum expected in a project description? And what I have so far, um, is most likely incomplete. I'm starting with an outcome, which ought to be like a single statement, a list of requirements, uh, you know, using this word like it's used in software development, some suggestions of how to start. What I want to do is in every description, just tell somebody, hey, here's what step one and two could be, you know, um, so people have I want people to feel like, oh, yeah, I could I could start doing that, right? I, I I don't have questions about what the first thing to do is, and I see enough here that I'm going to be able to then really dig into the meat of this task. Links and tips could be anything, right? Just any tutorials, any articles, maybe they're technical or maybe they're philosophical or maybe they're something else, right? Um, just links and tips, once again, to help people get started. Maybe these two things are one and the same. I don't know, uh, but we can figure it out. And then how to complete it. And so every, every one of these in the current system, you specify an approval process right here. All right? And that triggers just pulling the approval process from a list within the project repo. So for example, off screen, I'm just gonna change the approval process from a four to a five. I'm gonna save that. And if I refresh the front end, oh, I didn't, those are probably still the same right now. I didn't make those different yet. Let me change it to a two instead. Approval process two, and then reload the page. 
something else isn't working now. Oh, my server's not running. All right, now the server's running again. And let's reload that now. Live group. You're, you're using the uh, live website, right? Oh, that's, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's embarrassing. Uh, very good. Why well, want to change then? Um, there we go. Okay, approval process, live group approval, right? And then if I if I change just that single number and I refresh, we can see a, a different approval process here. Fine. Okay, so so this part is just automated and from a single list, but the how to complete might be unique each time. So I was thinking that that should be a different uh, a different section right here. So any feedback or clarifying questions on how these five subheadings feel right now? Would you add or remove anything? Julie, what do you think? Um, my question is, do we need something like preconditions or something? Or if we have dependencies between some tasks? Yeah. So this, sometimes there will be dependencies and other times it'll be an entry point. So I think this is, this is a often but not always field. And one question I have is, should we, should we try to list those? And maybe we do, right? Maybe, maybe that's it. Or do we try to do something here in the metadata? For example, I made this like array of BBKs as, as maybe one, one way to think about preconditions or, or prior knowledge, right? Here's, here's, the, here's the background knowledge you would need in order to do this thing. So yeah, I think this, this should be part of it. And my question is, do we, do we put it you know, here or here? Do we make, do we require this part or do we make it optional or do we think about metadata that we could use here? looking at looking at the list we've got this this dev category and i've been struggling for a couple of days with language um I think I think it's the right choice to move beyond the word bounty. I heard the feedback from enough people that it didn't feel great to be using the word bounty. So okay, let's let's change that word to project. And I like the word project. I like that the that this word builds from 
the project-based learning course, right? What's the, what's the prerequisite for participating in this system at all? You've engaged in some level of project-based learning. And now that you've done that, what do you get to do? You get to do projects. The problem with the word project is that now what do you call a collection of projects, right? It, it, before, if we were using the word bounty, we were able to say, well, a collection of bounties could be called a project. And to me, that makes a lot of sense. So does it feel right to use, to, to be calling this thing right here a project? Or is it something else? And then what's the superstructure for this? Right, what's if I take a bunch of these? What's that collection of them called? <laughs> uh, I've been I've been playing around with that a bit and wondering if anybody has thoughts. Alex, what do you say? Uh, this comes to a talk I had uh, with Randall some time ago, and he's still done collectively, right? And what uh, how he thinks about it is uh, you have working groups which are more loosely like, you know, they don't have a, they have general topic, but not a project which is like they work on. And uh, they just convene regularly. And then if you have collection of tasks, then it's a project, yeah. So a project is a something that, uh, well, we all know, yeah, is as a end user and the implementation and uh, like a plan or something like that. But I don't know why you don't like bounty, you know, look at GitHub, what they call like is issues, you know, and like, that's a bad word, you know, in some, in some contexts. And uh, people use it, it's fine. I think uh, bounties are okay, I don't know. I, I'm finding that it's, it's hard to not use the word bounty, right? I removed it from the front end, but not the back end just to experiment with removing it. Um, but it's hard, it's hard not to use it. And it feels, it feels like a word that that does the, the trick. Um, but I also, I got that feedback enough unique times to, to wonder, hey, like what, what could we do differently? And I, I do think that the web two and even the, the web almost three definition of the word bounty it isn't is not quite what we're going for here uh at the risk of being repetitive i, I might have said this yesterday like i i disagree with the approach of bounties serving as competitions in a lot of current bounty platforms the bounty description is posted and everybody gets to work racing to get the answer, you know, the, the solution to it. And whoever delivers the solution first gets the reward. And everybody else who might have been doing great work, but wasn't the first one to submit it successfully, gets nothing. I don't like that. And so I wonder if we can leave behind that logic by also reconsidering the word we're using right now. Campaign, yeah, a collection of projects is a campaign. A collection of projects is a program. Well, it's a program is in a social sense, like, you know, yeah. <clears throat> how you say, like, yeah. social security program or whatever, something like that. Yeah. So- Space exploration program. <laughs> it, well, and so, okay, now, with all of this stuff in mind, let's, the reason I felt good at first using project, even though I'm realizing in practice, it's hard to use it is because of the mesh definition of data. And this is true for Plutus as well. What's data? It could be a string. 
It could be a number. Oh, or it could be an array of more data or a map of data to data, right? So what's a project? Maybe it's a single description, but maybe it's a list of other projects. And so is it fair to say that a project could be defined like this, like, like this, all of this defines this project, or a project could also be a set of these. Is that too confusing or could, could it work? Reward, yeah. Could it be that these things are just called commitments, front end commitments? What are you gonna do? Find a commitment to commit to and then get a reward. Yuli, in the agile sense, would, would this, this thing right here, just a single one of these be a story or would a collection of them be a story? A single one would be a story. So you have front end stories and, or you have a front end epic and an epic consists of multiple stories then. Stories, okay, an epic consists of one or more stories. Yeah, I've stories consist of tasks, something like this, yeah? Yeah. I've learned enough about Agile to know that if you partially implement Agile, you get a lot of, you get a lot of pushback from serious Agile people. So I, I always hesitate to only pick and choose from Agile without going all the way. This is not a decision to make today, and we can. Uh, one thing that's exciting about people creating different instances of this is that we're going to have chances to experiment with language and and move towards what works best. Um, I'm I'm curious about about calling these tasks and sets of them projects. I'm curious about calling these commitments. And then they can be parts of projects, um, or like I said, just using it like it's used here. But but as people have more ideas on that, let's keep communication lines open. Justin, was was your hand up? Uh, never mind. Sorry about that. Oh, you sure? Okay. But I do want to experiment with including dependencies or prereqs or preconditions here as well. And so I'm going to leave this as a note to sell. Um, I'm going to move this to the bottom just for now, uh, just to see, like, to, to be thinking about where this goes. Um, and then here's, let's, let's go here. This, this is one that's more fleshed out, more complete than others. And to make it easier to read, let me look at it on the front end. How close is this description to being what it needs to be? Where, where is it saying too much and where is it still leaving questions open? What advice do you have here?
Yeah. Okay, Justin, to your question in the chat, this is one of the first times we got together to talk about this. Um, Nelson pointed out that probably sooner or later, we want some kind of, you know, commenting or discussion section. And yeah, like like you just said, like you know, we could we could link from here to issue cards, uh, or you know, get GitLab issues. Um, but I think in the long run, it's absolutely best to have those comments and that discussion embedded right here. And that's going to require a little a little back end service, right? Here's now something that we need, even if it's minimal, some kind of database for. Um, but I think that's that's really worth it um, to be building that sooner than later, probably. I also I had a question on when I guess this is kind of uh, a future problem, but once other um, individuals or organizations begin adding their own instances, I was wondering how those, how the issuers are going to be differentiated. So I know you guys talked about reputation a lot um, for both the contributor and the issuer yesterday, uh, and I missed most of that, but um, is there some, like, I'm wondering how instances are going to be kind of separated and sorted, or if they're all going to intermingle within the GPT website. Um, and it's kind of just like a front end issue, but, um, and also, is there going to be something to like signal, um, I don't know, like, uh, yeah, like a way to identify the issuer um, as being this organization or this individual who has this kind of history or reputation. Um, so somebody that's trying to commit would um, uh, know, you know, if they've enjoyed working with them in the past, or is it just all going to be somewhat uh, pseudonymous or uh, a little obscure? Yes. Okay. Uh, and does that, does anybody else want to start? with Justin's question, this is this is so critical. This is so, so important. I have a lot to say here, but I'm just wondering if anybody else has initial thoughts. So, and please interrupt me here. This this is so important, and we're going to be having a conversation about this for a while. Okay, like this is this is the next months or maybe years of work. My goal is for us to find out what's really possible, building from this concept of headless DApps. I, I think it's a really important idea. And I think that I think that we haven't learned all there is to learn about it yet. And so I'm hoping that by working this way, we are opening ourselves to some really important insights or new structures or new patterns uh, by by working this way. Um, so two two things yeah if you got if you got links heck yeah dad well that's confusing um so first things first right there's this there's the i'm on my local host now right but um we had the we have this deployment of of this instance of the dap right At a really simple level, the goal here is to provide the repos for the Plutus part and for the front end part. People can customize it however they want. And it's up to them at the end of the day to host those things. All right, they'll have their own URL. That said, is it likely 
that it would help developers to have websites that collect many instances of GPTEs, right? I, I'm a dev. I don't want to have to keep track of all those different links to all those independent instances. It'll probably feel better to have one place I can go and say, oh, I could work on that project or that project or that project, right? This raises new questions. Okay, well, who, who's in charge of, of those directories of multiple instances? And my idealistic answer to that question is, well, if there's a way like there is with the faucet mini project to register an instance, then anybody who wants to can look at that on-chain metadata and create a unique front end that serves as a directory. And in doing so, they can, they can have their own editorial, right? They can express their own editorial beliefs about which GPTEs to prioritize, right? How are things ordered on that page? These are, these are governance questions. These are political questions, right? Whose instance of the GPTE goes at the top of the list? That's really interesting. And so unique instances, uniquely hosted, and likely with directories as a first step, but maybe even I can imagine a, a scenario where, yeah, the, the commitment cards themselves are coming from a variety of instances, but maybe they're collected and, and sorted in some way, right? That could be really interesting. What projects are these from, right? What issuer or organization are these from? They're from a variety and they're all collected here and then sorted in some way. That's really interesting to me. And, and that's gonna take some time to get to that point. In between, to your other point, Justin, we've got, we've got the reputation of issuers themselves, right? We've done a lot of conversation about the reputation of contributors. We have an initial implementation of that, sure. But I agree. I think I think issue it's going to be just as important to have issuer reputation. What is it like to work with this group? Right. And so we're going to need to collect that. Maybe there are if if I'm a directory maker, right? If if we're going to have a GPTE directory hosted at Gimbal Labs. Maybe it's another link on this page or something. Maybe, maybe we will have some rules about the reputation that that issuer has demonstrated so far. Hey, you want to be listed on our directory? Uh, show us that you've been, you know, a fair delegator of work so far by showing whatever evidence we come up with for that. Um, yeah, so so measuring measuring contributor satisfaction in some way, measuring that issuers are distributing when they're supposed to, for example. Though these are all things that we're going to want to look at, uh, and lot lots of unknowns. I hope you can hear, you know. But this this is I really I think we have a really special opportunity to pioneer this stuff, and so I, I hope. I hope when you hear my uncertainty, uh, it's it's exciting and makes it feel current. Like this is, I don't think this is really being done, fully explored yet. We have a lot of web two implementations of quote unquote web three things. We have Gitcoin on Ethereum, but it's just another intermediary, right? I, don't, I, I'm, I just, I'm not aware of many examples that are taking this headless DAP concept to, to new conclusions.
So does that feel exciting or wishy-washy though, right? Like what, it, how does, how does that message land for people? Are, are, are we here for it? Dagwell, well, what do you say? Man, first of all, I started reading um, Emergent. Um, I just, I just remember Emergent because like the first, like <laughs> that's the first. Um, yeah. And it, it's, um, it's really crazy with like how we're working together and just to look at this in the bounty system. And I had a way, I had a, a time to speak to um, a Kevin with the proof of article. And he brought up a point. Um, there is, um, there was like people who were offering like a stake pool, um, you know, like to, you know, revenue of a stake pool based off a token. Um, I think it's done by the Cardano press people. I'm not really sure. Um, and he was like, he was asking my advice, like, hey, should we join? I was like, well, you know, let, let's first see what we're offering over here because your your piece in the middle with the tokenomics, um, I, I feel like people are going to go there in, in a in a way that's going to be more custodial where you're going to have to be like giving away a certain amount of your tokens to a stake pool. And here with the headless dApp, like, I mean, the possibilities of, of creating like a token, not for paying devs in this instance, but for whatever you use liquidity for. And that's really, that's really get, got me excited. It's like one way to measure the reputation of an issuer is the, like, is there a way to measure their stewardship of some token? Gosh, yes. And especially if you, you know, you know, how much it, coin is moving um you know that has a certain amount of they're just not like pumping dumping but it's also it could be like how active is the community as well and this is all ledger open um so i'm, I'm really excited about how we can also use the things that we already have like pulling a, a policy count you know to see how many times uh coin is being minted or sent um it, it really blows my mind i don't even think we're kind of like in the book we're kind of living a little like a little sleep we, we haven't really woken up to the possibilities that it offers here. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting excited. Thanks for picking up that book. And uh, for, for any, again, at the risk of, of being repetitive, I put the link in the chat. I could not more strongly recommend a book right now. I've, I've read, read a few books that have really helped me to clarify my thinking over the last two years. Um, but none of them have felt as important as this one. Uh, I, I feel like it's, Steve and I were talking about language as technology yesterday. And I think this, this book is finally the one that gives me language to better express what I've been kind of, kind of trying to start. And it's, yeah, I, we're, we're going to, we're, anybody, anybody here is welcome to read it and to participate in then a book club where our goal is to kind of launch the next round of tokenomics PBL by taking the concepts that resonate from this book and saying, okay, if, you know, first of all, let's, let's align on what's the most important stuff we're reading here. What are some, what are some things that we can, that we've been doing or could, could, further experiment with and then based on that what would happen if we really built a tokenomics structure that was that was committed to 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 bringing to life some of these ideas i, I think when i when we're looking at like the way that the natural reflects and what really stood out to me just at the very beginning was it, where she was saying that like every action that you know we do as humans it is somewhere represented in nature so they're all valid but it's it's choosing which way to go and when the apex predators are going extinct i was like oh my no <laughs> oh my no i mean it was great <laughs> yeah. what we do at the smallest scale matters too and that and that concept I, have you gotten to the part where she talks about how urgency is what got us here? You know, all of all of the systems that we have that maybe aren't working for one reason or another 
originally popped up because people were able to convince themselves that something was urgent, that it was worth cutting a corner, you know, and trees don't do that. No, and where she was, oh my God, that's so beautiful. She was kind of alluding it to where she was saying that like complex systems now started as patterns, you know, trade routes, or this is convenient for me. I can go to this bush and do this. And then pretty soon they're like, hey, let's build a community out of that. And they just kind of stuck. And it's just, well, especially and I'm, I'm at the very beginning, but when she talks about like the last 50 years and kind of like a charismatic, like psychopath leading, like I just, you know, you know, a little bit of my background, just coming from that world directly and then seeing someone so elegantly put it out there. Um, and I'm only at the beginning. So I'm just, I'm excited. I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm jealous of some of the pages you get to read for the first time now. See, that's, uh... You can't have my new memories, nah, 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 boo, boo. <laughs> Yeah, the 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 reminder that defaulting towards patience is is probably a good idea. And that the natural world suggests that is very helpful to me because it's, you know, so far this industry has not necessarily encouraged patience, but, you know, we, part of what resonates with me about Cardano is, is it is, it seems to me to be the patient blockchain. Okay. So, so now how do we, speaking of structures, how do we replicate that the level of patience that was taken to build the protocol to kind of build these kind of these new ways of of working together on top of it so we'll see oh come on no there's much more unruly groups we got i think we could we could do to be a little bit more unruly couldn't we <laughs> we will we just have to get together in person sooner or later. Yeah, good. good. Cool. Well, so a lot of high level stuff today. Um, to reiterate from yesterday, these approval processes are still are still up to us there's 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 nothing right here on this list of potential approval processes that must stay the way it's written and i think it's worth it to assume that these will change over time and they might be unique from instance to instance in order to establish that instance to instance work, we got to make sure that we have great documentation for this tool. And as it rolls out on mainnet, you know, that, that we can bring people in. Hey, when you set up an instance, yeah, you got to decide what the issuer token is. Yeah, you got to decide what the contributor token is. And it's up to you to define your approval processes. Here's the ones that we've used in the past, and here's the ones we're using right now maybe you'll want to add your own this is going to be this is going to be expertise speaking of emergence that emerges from people doing this right that there's there's no better way to come up with the best list of approval processes than to just go out try things and recognize that they're going to change over time and so the exact same thing is true for how we talk about project descriptions here right there's there's a current list of headings. We should add to this list something along the lines of dependencies and prerequisites. And that then gets us thinking about structures. What are, what are we calling these things, right? What is a collection of these things called? So a lot of high level work to do there. And we are we're maximizing space for experimentation and kind of freedom to choose alternatives right there there is not a white paper for this maybe there will be someday and if there is it's going to be written by a lot of people okay but but there's no urgency to write a white paper that says here's exactly how it is 
what there is is space where we got to be looking at this together and 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 testing it out. So thanks you all for staying at this high level today. Um, my next dev priorities are to, uh, as I've said a bunch of times over the last few weeks, just to make sure that we have a Plutus V2 version of this thing so we can release on mainnet and to kind of confirm that the new sort of contributor token, right, with the token pairs is viable for the first release of this. I would really, really like to use even a, even a simple implementation of that contributor token when we first release this on mainnet. Uh, but I, I only want to do that if it's safe. And so uh, I'll be asking for some help early next week to kind of double check that that's going to be okay. And so if everybody here can think through what exists of that contributor token so far, and if you can find any reasons that, oh, that would that would introduce some other complication, we shouldn't use it in, in mainnet version one of this, uh, just let me know. But please try to think about that um, because I think it'll be really exciting to have a, a rudimentary version of that, of those token pairs uh, in that mainnet release. Um, so those are my next two dev steps and then things quiet down a little bit from a live coding perspective next week. Uh, I won't be able to be here next Thursday. Going to be on route to uh, the actual summit to meet some people in person. Um, yeah, anybody else going? I know Yuli's going. Anybody else here headed to Switzerland? Want well, to see you real soon. Yeah, next year, Trevor. Yeah. Yo, and to, to everybody who can't make it this year, this is, I, I want to have a, a, a real hackathon, like the kind that's not, you know, for somebody else, but a hackathon that's for us in person uh, in, in the next year and can start planning that maybe in December. Um, I, it would be so good to spend time together. Um, and then, yeah, future summits. One, I'm leaving late night on Wednesday, taking the overnight flight and landing Thursday morning. Miami wouldn't be the worst place for a hackathon, would it? Oh, nice, Yuli. Yeah, that's easy. That's good. All right. So be in touch. Thanks for thanks for thinking at high level today. Um, Mindy, thanks for being here, y'all. All right, catch you soon.